그럼 어, 발표하실 하주 스님께서는 The next presenter, 하주 스님 하주 스님도 미국에서 오셨습니다 uh, came from uh, the United States uh, Michigan uh, from uh, the s o l y o n s a Temple She came uh, from four people and traveled through uh, Korea, and they uh, introduced themselves as uh, Korean Buddhists from the states. Today's uh, theme is all our Buddhas tending the Buddha Dharma from the ground up. Seoul is at work this morning. Men and women have been walking in meditation in the side yard. Our conference proceeds this morning as we have gathered from the Ten Directions. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude to be here. Anyang hi chumu shu sam ni ka. So warm greetings this auspicious day in the land of the morning calm. We have gathered from the Ten Directions to share our Dharma lives. It's a rare opportunity for us to be together. And I'm very grateful to be here all the way from the Zen Buddhist Temple in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's near Detroit, yeah. And the University of Michigan is there so that you can get an idea of where it is. I am one of two Dharma heirs of Venerable Samosunam, who's from Korea. He went to the United States in 1967. And I have been his student since 1978. Hello, I'm currently sir. serve as a senior teacher for the Buddha Society for Compassionate Wisdom while residing in the Ann Arbor Temple. where I offer meditation instruction and retreats, guide the extended community both locally and further afield, and also work in the garden. Yeah. Altogether, our efforts have been to establish Korean Sun in the US, Mexico, and Canada. We have Yes, yeah, okay. We have, wow, we have five temples and one farm. Yeah. And today I'm going to talk more practically about some of the things which I've experienced and perhaps some wisdom over the about 40 y or more years that I have been practicing Buddhism. After my pilgrimage to Korea in 1982, unfolds the story of pioneering. I moved with my then three-year-old daughter to join her father in Ann Arbor. After a rented apartment, some time in a member's home, then in a University of Michigan rental, rental housing, we found an old Victorian home, an empty boarding house, and purchased it with the financial support of Koreans. Over time, we learned it had been owned by the sister of an early wealthy state representative in Michigan. It had been a doctor's office. It had been a black bordello, a fraternity house, and then empty for two years when we purchased it. 
The building had a bullet hole in the thick plate glass foyer window. It was a grey area with a lot of poverty and a little violence on the street. The, the building was full of furniture, including nine jukeboxes. It's a kind of big record player. Yep. Its owner had been, at that point, an African-American woman who moved to the West Indies, where we sent our monthly land contract payment in the amount of $954 and some cents. We created a meditation room with a pile of big cardboard boxes and put a cloth on top and there placed a Buddha which Samusunam had sent for us. We cleared out all the furniture and household items and had our first yard sale in the backyard, advertising by flying a banner from a bike which we rode around town. The front hedge, the trees, bushes in front of the building, froze the first winter. Michigan is a cold place, yeah. And so, with the help of a stonemason, we built a wall and a gate, which created more of a sanctuary inside. Kumara, who had been a singer and a guitar player in a rock and roll band, began a vegetable garden. News of our activity, there's a Buddhist temple in town, trickled out and a few men and women turned up to practice with us on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 10 p.m. to help with the yard sale, with renovations, and to work in our carpentry business. We started to help pay the bills and the monthly land contract. There were only three or four of us and it seemed like a miracle to be able to make the monthly payments. One resident, Musham Patricia Ikeda, described her situation as a full-time resident under a vow of poverty in 1983 with these words written on her website. Designated the office manager, I began with a landline phone, a small wooden bench to write on, some pens, the temple checkbook, and a shoebox for petty cash and receipts. And over the next several years, helped to build the temple along with a diverse sangha that included Zen practitioners from the US, Mexico, Canada, Korea, and Japan. I became pregnant, I was married, yeah. with our second daughter, who was born unexpectedly early at the beginning of our winter retreat, which was held back in Canada at our Toronto temple. She was named Gomani, a Korean name, Gomani, by Sunim on the phone from Mexico where he was leading another retreat. When we all returned to the Ann Arbor Temple, we were four or five children and about 12 adults. We had Sangha gatherings with our members from the community and enjoyed delicious vegetarian food, a vibrant playing of instruments, singing, and dancing. We had 
Dharma dialogues on Friday night that often remained silent. And Sunam, Samu Sunam, regularly visited to provide guidance and to lead retreats. I'll show you a picture of Sunam a little later. I think all the pictures at the end. Okay. We'll start. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So those are some um, pictures of Sunam in the bottom two pictures. And then in our Quincium Posel room with my daughters who at the time were maybe six and two. And then in that middle picture at the top is a picture of our precept taking where our members formally take the Buddhist precepts, not to harm but to cherish all life not to lie, but to speak the truth, all of those. So this is kind of a people picture. There's one more of Sunam with students. Let's see if we can get it. Yes, here. This was in the 60s, you can, or it, like this, not the 60s, it was the 80s actually. But there was the longer hair. And there's Sunam right in the front. Perhaps you recognize him, some of you, if you're very old. He's 81 now. And that was after a young man, Zhongzhen. We always would go and stand on the stairs to take a picture of people who had participated. Besides the young man, Zhongzhen's and the regular practice each day, Sunam started uh, summer retreats with us where we would keep um, practice and silence for 30 days in the summer times, waking at four in the morning, meditating till eight, renovating the building all day, and then sitting in the evening from six to 10. Sometimes we would have Sunday off. It was 1985, my temple duties and focus on my children meant that I was no longer focused on my relationship and my husband strayed. He left the temple with one of our residents. Now, a single mother with two spunky children, I was asked by Sunam to be the director. I was the only one left there. <laughs> so I had no idea at that point what I was getting in for. My own daughters were a blessed and irreplaceable part of our temple crucible and my life. I had many hard lessons in learning balance regarding their care especially each evening by preparing an early supper for them, by freely giving my presence and time without thinking what temple work needed to be done, and by patiently getting them to bed with snacks and stories, all before our evening yoga and meditation practices. At one point, my mother helped to pay local university students to care for the girls some evenings. And when I was away, the help of members was very much appreciated. It was always balancing what the temple programs asked of me and of what two small children also demanded of me. <laughs> Being director and living at the temple was like being at work 24-7. There was always something to do, and so it was with raising my daughters. My time 
with them was crucial to our well-being and to bringing perspective to my many temple responsibilities. Sadly, I did not always succeed with the balancing. A poem from January 27th, 2009. Venerable Samusunum always asked us to journal from the time of that first pilgrimage in 1982, every day of the pilgrimage, throughout all my days at the temple. So I have many journals. In this one, with my daughter Gomani, a little poem which I wrote. Sitting with my visiting 25-year-old daughter Gomani, sharing a glass of dry red wine, then walking home in the snow, a rare day, lovely. When I first began studying with Sunim, he asked us not to read about Buddhism, but to do the renovation work and the formal daily practices. So no reading. So in Ann Arbor, when I became responsible for giving talks and knowing about Buddhism, I thought I knew nothing. Even though I had lived at the temple for several years, we had not had a study program as such. I started to read about Buddhism and turned to what the Buddha taught by Walpul Rahula. This proved to be just the right book for me at the time because it articulated many of my experiences. I could relate to the Four Noble Truths, an eightfold path. <laughs> for instance, yes, clinging to my way especially does cause suffering. And yes, focus on right effort, right speech, and right action in particular bring more peace and skillful responses. Gradually, I read more widely. This was part of our seminary program, which eventually developed. So I read more uh, widely the life of the Buddha, the lives of the disciples, the scriptures, including Jataka tales, Korean sun, and the study of Mahayana. A poem, another poem from the journal, May 3rd, 2010. With vigor, integrity, and wondrous intention, we walk into that which we yet cannot see. In preparation for this talk, I read through the journals that I kept from the first pilgrimage until now, and I'm grateful that I kept the practice of journaling, which Sunim encouraged. However, I did not always enjoy reading them, especially the early ones, because I was acutely um, aware of my human foibles, which I always talked about in my journals. I'm too tired. There's too much work. How come there's not enough people to help? And it was, I didn't like all of that negative journal stuff. But I also could see that all of these foibles of mine were fertile ground. From my perspective today, it's been a blessed, astonishing Dharma adventure, however challenging the daily formal practice, the duties, the children, the temple. Part of my journals also revealed, of what they revealed, was the memory of my own loneliness and how I sought companionship, then lost companionship, and tried again. Eventually, I realized after a trip to Mexico when Sunim asked me to find my life pa partner, the Buddhist Society for Compassionate Wisdom is a non-celibate order. 
So he, he said, go to Mexico and find your life partner. So by, when asked, let, let me read this again. I'm trying to keep with the script so the person who's translating knows what's going on. Um, let's see. Yeah. Eventually I realized after a trip to Mexico, when Sunim asked me to find my life partner, that I was my own life partner. I am. Yeah. By this point, I had been a single mother for about a decade, and I had been running the temple for almost as long. The struggle of how to be alone and how to be with others is such a vivid part of the human experience. My companionship was ultimately in the Sangha growing up around me. And with my daughters, my sister in Victoria, British Columbia, and one or two local friends, one from a Buddhist group. My journal reading also revealed my frequent lack of focus and constant fatigue and many complaints, as I said, especially when I was so green with all of it. My daily practice often seemed of no help whatsoever. But as I read my journals, I did see, did see that things changed slowly. Let me, another poem, let me enjoy my long list. It will all get done, or not. 11.07 p.m. How fortunate that someone will come so late to help with a leaky heater. Sometimes I lapse into ease. Wonderful. All the while, the Sangha continued to grow. In 1999, we bought a little house beside the original temple and moved in to have a little more space for family life. My youngest daughter, in particular, was eager for that. And in, again in 2004, we bought another building which had been a grocery store and a bike shop and renovated it to become our Buddha Hall, where we now host our public services, meditation courses, retreats, and other Dharma events such as benefit auctions and Buddhist birthday celebrations. And in 2019, we tore down the small family house and erected a completely new Sangha house to accommodate our growing Zen families and temple residency program. During the years of our building expansion and renovation, together action prevailed. The gravel parking lot, which we had acquired, was turned into a vegetable garden and native plants garden by bringing in nine truckloads of topsoil which formed a small mountain range across the yard. We rented a bulldozer and flattened the mounds, adding in loads and loads of leaves. Kale in large quantities became a steady crop most years and was harvested even from the snow for breakfast during winters. And there is so much more. Maybe in the book, some of the stories about my pilgrimage and meeting Sunchal Sunam you can read. And also when I first met Venerable Samu Sunam. But right now, I will try to share some just humble things that I have learned over my years of, of service at the temple. The first, to listen a lot to gather and confer. I already know what I know, so when I really listen to others, I learn what might be worthwhile to say or not. First, seek to understand rather than to be understood is an old saying. 
When you know better, you do better. So listen, then keep up with people. Keep people feeling connected with the temple. Writing thank you notes. We are founded and function completely on the generosity of others. And to write thank you notes in response, I have found to be a good practice for myself and appreciated. Also, we have sent communication out via our spring wind journals, temple bulletins, and now e-bulletins. We have an e-bulletin both for our adults and also for our Zen family and children's programs. Our editor of that e-bulletin is here with us today. Please put your hand right up, Hayun. Yeah. It's a way, thank you. She, Hayun has been working at a really wonderful communication with the Sangha, especially through the pandemic. So listening, keeping up communication, and then children are integral to our Sangha. That's been our case. We included them from the beginning in peace camps, family programs, hunger walks, and more. They are spontaneous Buddhas who bring forth our love and spontaneity and play and patience. In 1986, we had our first peace camp. Twelve small children, several in diapers, and in the backyard. And that continued and grew from a half-day camp to five full days of outdoor camping when we moved to Friends Lake Community, a Quaker nature reserve. This is a magical story of sharing responsibilities with adult campers to the point where at present and for the last approximately 10 years, the camp has been flourishing under the guidance of our parents. It's a beautiful sharing of responsibility. Campers and their families come in from many parts of the U.S. and the camp is now six days long. About 15 teenagers and their chaperones from Korea joined us about 10 years ago and quickly harmonized with our camp Sangha. Professor Cho assisted with their visit and it was a wonderful experience, I think, for all of us. And I conclude this section in saying that actually it's good I started with children, but it's good to have all ages. It's good to have all ages. It's wonderful for the older people in the Sangha to see the children and the children to be cared for by the older people. And of course, everything in between. Storytelling. Telling stories touches people's hearts and minds. Our Korean sun tradition has innumerable earthy stories. Wonhyo stories and Kyonghyo stories and every kind of story. And so, and there are hundreds of Jataka tales and compelling stories from the lives of the Buddhas and disciples, all with lessons for the here and now. Good stories never grow old. 
So we do a lot of storytelling in our sangha. And we've even had storytelling workshops and special storytellers coming. It's um, often learn a lot about Buddhism through stories and songs. Yeah. Enjoy. Singing and dancing from time to time, spontaneous entertainment. These get, this gets us embodied, because so much time we are in our heads. So doing the things that get us embodied is important. One evening when we were spontaneously entertaining around the wood stove after a day of renovation, we took turns dancing on five-gallon buckets. I don't know, the white buckets that usually have paint in them or glue or drywall splatter, yeah. When we went to Korea, I realized this spirited together action was often part of the culture in Korea as well. Opera, like singing, playing instruments, storytelling. Sunam, Samo Sunam, would sing at gatherings as we traveled around the country. I felt untalented, but he encouraged me. You can do the headstand. I was a yoga teacher. I am a yoga teacher. Quite embarrassed, I did the headstand in many places in Korea. And everyone clapped and thought it was amusing, at least. So good hard labor with a group of people really builds temples. And I bet everyone here knows that. Yeah. We've had um, big, great green yard sales. We keep extensive gardens. We do constant upkeep and maintenance. We had to dig a tunnel by hand under one of our buildings to install steel beams. We have our annual peace camp organization, which because we have sometimes 150 people for six days, it involves a lot. Yeah. So we've had much constant together action. We have built beautiful temples and a farm for our Sangha. And at the same time, it's been bonding. So we grow very close to each other. Food preparation and meals are at the marrow of community living. Starting with silence, eating our food mindfully, then often sharing vibrant discussions on a Dharma topic are wonderful ways of being together. Sending people out to the garden to harvest broccoli or kale and realizing they don't know how to identify it and then helping them to know the foods they eat, where they are grown, basic things that we just do at the temple. I'm going to speed through a little bit here. Uh, my next section is do the laundry and patch clothes. I find just simple things like folding laundry with people can be very meditative and create a kind of spaciousness and clear mind. So whenever there's a big basket of laundry, it's a good time. Embodiment. I cannot talk about meditation, about our meditation practice, without addressing the body. As we liberate our talking heads, the body knows. There comes deep, visceral presence in each very moment and beginning of experience of interbeing and timelessness, spaciousness, peace. Fresh and curious with this embodiment, people more genuinely take up their meditation practice. Yeah. Learning the nourishment of silence and unplugging from media. We encourage silence after evening meditation and chanting until a bell is rung during breakfast time. Peace of mind is an inside job learning to feel comfortable in your own body-mind without outside stimulus. Okay. 
Some thoughts for the future? First, I think we have to share this wisdom and compassion tradition with younger people who are our continuation. A good few will do. Great Vow Monastery in Oregon sends people to career fairs and offers monastic training alongside big companies and the armed forces, also offering opportunity. Sometimes we have to be innovative to attract our young people. We've tried summer work-study programs, which can be successful. I think this is coming to be enough because my time is running out. Sorry, my friend in the booth. <laughs> I'm going to skip along further to the end. One of the things that I think is especially important today, and I realize it more so having been in Korea for the last week and been at Han Saw and Song Kwan Saw, is that we all need to be exposed to nature and be in nature as much as possible. Samu Sunam wrote in his Song of Meditation, sit still, rest. You're one with all beings sentient, insentient. Rocks, trees, mountains, rivers, clouds, sky. Breathe, concentrate. You're one with all beings sentient, birds, animals, insects, worms, fish, humans. And this thinking ahead, my experience is it's wise from time to time to get to know clergy from other sanghas in our area, to invite them to join in dharma activities like Buddhist birthday celebrations, Buddhist global relief hunger walks, like this. To visit them on their special occasions and to enjoy their company. Currently, we are preparing, have prepared humanitarian aid in the form of a container of food for the Ukraine. We got together with other sanghas as well as the interfaith community and our local neighborhood to do this. We have not been so active in this community building and this getting together with other Buddhists during the pandemic, but slowly that will resume. Can you get the picture of the container? Oh. Is it there? Yeah. Let's give you an idea for our... Here's the container. See the, mid the middle picture is we got a big cargo container and filled it with food. And we also had murals on three sides of it. And the Sangha did the one on this side you can see some of the children, there were a lot of people involved. And then on one of the, both the other side were local artists who did really special mural work. Yeah. And we did um, some walking and chanting around the container uh, as a kind of blessing and dedication ceremony. So that's what, that's me doing that one. And let's see, what's the other one there? What is it? How just name? We will start from the beginning. Oh. The other one was loading. Oh, that's right. That's at the front of the temple. The pictures just give you an idea about. Uh, we have four buildings and about maybe half an acre of land, a big garden of all sorts. Yeah. 
So concluding remarks. Yeah. This Buddha, we cut down a tree that was really um, rotting. It was a big maple, silver maple tree, and just didn't want to cut the whole tree down. So we left it, and then one of good friends is a, a, a ecclesiastical carver, and so he did the standing Buddha, and it's supposed to remember, resemble a little bit our Korean style of Buddha, but a little more feminine. Yeah. And then that next to it at the top is our bigger Buddha hall, which is on, faces on a street, the big street. And then this is our original building on the, the yellow one that we got in 1982 with the help of the Korean supporters. So can, yeah. There's a lot to share, yeah. So concluding remarks. Oh, this one. Yeah. Well, we built a pond, and we have koi, and then where you see the lanterns hanging, it's a round garden, which is fenced in, and it's largely for vegetables, and the reason it's so fenced in is because we have a lot of animals at the temple that are always liking to eat vegetables. And so we plant veg things for them outside the fence, <laughs> and hopefully they'll stay there. And then the building is our new Sangha house. Yeah. And if the door is like a Korean door. Did you see? That same man that carved the um, Buddha carved the door for the Sangha house. So we try to keep our Korean um, heritage in little ways there in Michigan. And this is our, of course, Korean Buddha. Yeah. And on the side was Jijong Posel, which we got from a monas that monastery in Oregon. Yeah, good. Okay, finishing. A deep bow to Dei Heng Sunum and her inspiring work, and to all of you Han Maum members for your Dharma work these past 10 years. And now, to organize this conference for us. Happy anniversary, and thank you for getting us all together. And a deep bow of presentation to our presenters already. Uh, it's wonderful to hear from folks who are doing the same work. I'm honored to learn from them. And thank you to our Buddhist Society for Compassionate Wisdom Sangha, sometimes called Somriyunsa, that's an old name. To the clergy members who came with me, Hayun and Maum and uh, Jagwa, you'll, I hope you'll have a chance to meet them. They're, they are Bupsa, Bupsa teachers. And there's a, I'd like to conclude with a final verse from Venerable Samasunam, which I heard him give at the beginning of a Dharma talk in 2005. And it was done in a typically Korean fashion where he chanted it and he, you know, started with the, the Dharma staff and, and then he would end with Mahaprajna Paramita chanting very deeply and I haven't picked that one up yet, but here's the verse. If you don't cultivate your mind after obtaining human life, it's like going to Treasure Island and coming home broke. May we each cultivate and attain riches of Dharma for the benefit of all beings. Bodhisvaha. Your turn. Bodhisvaha. So today uh, we heard from three presenters. 
from uh, Western uh, Buddhism. Karma Leche Somo uh, told us about what is happening in Tibet right now. Um, the Tupten Cheden told us about uh, bhikkhunis, how they um, became uh, ordained and how they uh, practiced in the Tibetan Buddhism. Those bhikkhus um, came out from Tibet and uh, were too busy um, practicing outside of Tibet and they didn't have the time to uh, have um, disciples and then but in spite of all that uh, Tupten Cheden, Venerable Tupten Cheden is practicing um, in uh, at the uh, Shavasti Abbey and third um, Haju Sunim is the disciple of Samu Sunim and has been practicing uh, this uh, Zen Buddhism and I hope that you will um, understand that all those uh, pre presenters could uh, transmit Buddhism and especially Haju Sunim uh, could really uh, thanks to all those uh, Buddhism tradition she could have she could continue uh, that Buddhist um, uh, tradition. We have had many uh, questions, but as we don't have the time, uh, maybe uh, later we will have the time to answer. Thank you very much.